four o'clock straight up. So we're going to get going here. Why well, talk about cougars as pets when this is a workshop on the wild uh, cougar, mountain lion, etc. Well, I quickly learned that when I got started on this, that the pet role is very massive in trying to determine where cougars are, how cougars behave, and cougar-human interactions. So let's take a look here. Um, pet cougars. Uh, you, you're going to be amazed at how many places have pet cougars and a lot of the aspects dealing with the cougar. Uh, using the internet and working um, the black internet and the regular internet, we estimate there's 12,000 pet cougars in the United States, and there's a major trade in pet cougars. Uh, people like their cats. They just love their cats. Here's Easter Bunny pet cougar. If you see them over there on the right-hand side, notice those Easter Bunny ears that they put on their little pet cougar. They purr. They're cute. They're cuddly. They're adorable. People like their cats, and that includes cougars. They're posh. Uh, this is a uh, advertisement out of a major hotel, uh, Hotel Lucia, and uh, you see the lady with her low-cut dress and jewelry and the cougar on the leash coming out. Uh, they're macho. People like to see how cougars behave, and there are several situations of people having audiences and throwing in live animals to watch the cougar predation for the pets, so it's a macho aspect for some people. They're fun. Now, I'm kind of throwing in stuff about a lot of the pet cats that you can get on the internet, but you'll see small wild cats, exotic pets, uh, like the sand cat, and uh, oh, the cats, they're educational. Look at me and my lynx. My lynx knows enough to get up on the toilet seat to go to the bathroom, and he's so adorable, and they're safe. Oh yeah, no problem with my pet cougars. Uh, they're very safe animals. Well, they present data to show us how safe they are. Uh, cause of the death in 2001, heart disease. Your odds in your lifetime are one in five that you're going to die of heart disease. One is seven that you'll die in cancer. One in 23 of a stroke. Accidents, one in 36. Motor vehicle, uh, one in 100. Well, let's go down this list a bit. Electrocution, one in 5,000. Drowning, one in 8,942. Air traffic accident, one in 20,000. Mm. Legal execution, I like that one. Uh, my odds of getting legally executed are one in 58,000. Well, okay. Snake, bee, or other venomous sting, one in 100,000. Dog attack, one in 144,000. And we go on down here. Captive exotic cat. One in 400,000, not very likely. Captive bear, one in 32,000. So see, cougars are safe, they tell us. Uh, this is a group we'll talk about more later called Rexano for Responsible Exotic Animal Ownership. Um, and uh, the average number of deaths due to um, captive cats in the United States is uh, over a 20 year period, 1.1 per year. year. So your odds is one in 276 million. Hmm, sounds pretty good, okay. Uh, and they give out deaths due to tigers, lions, jaguars, leopards, ligers. A liger is a cross between a lion and a tiger. And uh, well, there's not many of those at all. And obviously it's tigers. You don't have to worry about a cougar. Um, it's these other captive exotic animals. People like their cats. Here's some quotes. I love my cougars, lynx, caracals, bobcats, Jeffreys, and servals. Thank you for acknowledging and respecting lovers of all things feline. Thank you for understanding the media only reports those cases of cruelty and ignorance, and that there are good pet owners out there, and we do a lot to maintain the viable gene pool that zoos alone cannot sustain. Now that gene pool argument's an interesting one, because zoos uh, keep a registry of all the animals in all the zoos, and the bloodlines of all the different animals and keep very good track of the gene pools and how they're being crossed. Not so for the owners, I would say. Thank you for knowing our cats will not attack or eat us, as many ignorant people think that have never heard the cougar purring that is curled up on my bed. Thank you for knowing 
the domestication of these felines needs to start now, as there so will be none left in the wild. Mm. Uh, we've got to save them out there in the wild. Thank you for knowing that in America you can hunt bobcats and cougars, and it is okay. It is still legal to own and sell bobcats and lynx for fur coats. But thanks to the media and the ignorant people that suck it up, you can't keep one as a loving and much loved pet. To all the people that think an exotic cat shouldn't be kept as a pet, first, go visit someone that keeps an exotic cat as a pet. Hear a cougar purr. Play with the lynx. Make your own firsthand knowledgeable decision. Hugging a cougar and having it hug you back will change your mind forever. Mm. Okay, if you still disagree, then you just don't like cats and want them destroyed along with the rest of the planet. Oh, yeah. People like their cats, and to say the least, they are... Uh, strongly opinionated. Now, Rexano, res Responsible Exotic Animal Ownership, uh, argues that these pets don't pose any more threat and that the problem is that the people out there have a fear of the unknown. So what is the safety related to these cats? Well, let me tell you a tale of good cats gone bad. And these are ones I've collected over the years. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see the date. So this is May of uh, 2004, Ohio. Search to find somebody's lost pet cougar. Uh, New York, four-year-old mauled by grandma's pet cougar. Florida, pet la cougar lounging near neighbor's pool spotted. Uh, man mauled to death by pet lion. That was a cougar. A non-secured lion escapes found four hours later, Indiana. Video of a cougar, probably a pet. Pet cougar escapes, attacks neighbor's dog. Large cat is spotted on the island of Hawaii. Hmm, you can bet he didn't swim there to get to that island. Uh, pet cougar escapes, owner has three other exotic species. Uh, four lions roaming near town, shot. Exotic farmer denies they aren't mine. I may have had cats, but couldn't be mine. Two lion cubs escape. Uh, pet lion bites woman feeding peaches to bear. <laughs> Okay, I like that one. Pet cougar escapes, roams neighborhood, captured. Pet lion cub escapes home, roams neighborhood. Pet cougar escapes, found on school bus. Isn't school bus where you keep kids? Uh, two lions escape, kill several farm animals. Neither divorcee wants the cougar, so they chain it behind the fence and leave it. Man charged animal cruelty. P police seizes cougar. Cougar, two bobcats found caged behind house. Pet cougar escapes, attacks dog. Homemade trap captures pet cougar missing 10 months in the neighborhood. Mm. Uh, pet lion attacks five-year-old boy. Six-year-old guy, girl attacked by friend's cougar. Pet cougar roams neighborhood, stolen from a closure. Pet cougar bites four-year-old. Pet cougar escapes, roams Galveston County. Pet cougar escapes, chain link startles neighbors. A pet cougar to animal shelter after it stalks the children. Pet cougar bites woman who had been assured by its handler. Oh, it's tame. A cougar named Missy escapes the property. Pet lion escapes closure during burglary. Chases youth into pickup. Pet cougar mauls seven-year-old boy after it escapes the cage. Cougar escapes, attacks five-year-old boy. Cougar mauls three-year-old boy and six-year-old sister, then attacks two dogs. Newt Gingrich bit on the chin while holding baby cougar. Boy, that one had some pretty good taste, I would have to say. Um, cougar escapes, forcing three children, three schools to keep children in. Cougar escapes is loose. Cougar kills woman, injures her friend. Pet lion attacks nine-year-old boy. Wow. Cougars running free were 26 of those 39 cases. They got loose from their pet owners. Uh, caged between the house or neglected, 8% of the cases we have. Uh, geographic distribution. Well, let's take a look at the map. What you see is that most of those pet cougars occur from a band that goes from Texas up through the Ozarks, Indiana, Illinois, uh, Southern Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, New York, and actually ends up in Vancouver. This is the pet cougar trade belt. Now, Florida down there is off the trade belt, but a lot of people down there have cougars. Florida allowed you to license your pet cougar for $15. And at one time they had 1,200 licensed pet cougars. Uh, you see pet cougars clear up into uh, Washington state. 
Where do the pet cougars come from? A lot are born or a lot are raised, bred and raised in uh, Texas into Missouri and the Ozark area. Some actually from game farms in Montana and up in Washington state. Uh, the trade belt is massive with 12,000 cougars in it. And from my sample size, you should take home the message, cougars escape. Uh, and when they escape, they can cause problems. And that of course gathers bad publicity out there for the wild cougars because they read the newspaper article that the cougar attacked, killed someone, killed grandma, bit Newt Gingrich on the chin. I still got to I'd vote for that cougar, I guess, uh, at that point. And so part of our question is, well, how pervasive is this problem? And Rainer Brock, uh, DNR at the University of, or I'm sorry, professor at the University of New York, has looked into it a lot. And he says it's very pervasive. And the problem is the excess breeding of exotic animals contribute to the surplus of captive species. And who's one of the biggest promoters of this uh, trend? It's the photographers. The photographers will pay good money to go in and get to photograph cougars. And here we've had a cougar, uh, a game farm just north of Livingston, Montana. We've had uh, two other big ones and a medium one in northwest Montana. One of the biggest ones is in uh, eastern Washington. And you go in and pay up to $300 per person an hour to photograph a cougar. And these cougars will often be out in exclosures that are fenced and um, have electricity in them so that you can shoot them against good backgrounds, wild looking backgrounds. And uh, so the trade in cougars is in part sponsored by the photographers. And nowadays, people that wanna be wildlife photographers are increasing rapidly in their numbers. Uh, large cats, by their nature, do not make good pets, nor do they adapt well to life in captivity. This is the International Fund for Animal Welfare out of their brochure, and they encourage people to surrender their pets. Now, TD's cats, every time I look at that, it looks to me like TD's scats, but it's TD's apostrophe S cats, TD's cats, is a refuge that handles these. When people get fed up with their cat, they got to do something with it. Um, and they may turn it loose, or if they're responsible, maybe they can find a refuge that will handle it. The problem is refuges have a limited capability. And uh, TD's cats, uh, they take in a lot of the animals. Another one is Big Cats of Serendi Springs. And Big Cats of Serendi Springs uh, gets cougars, but they get all the other cats also. And let's just look a little at their argument here. Meet the new tigers. You can adopt a tiger for $125. That means you donate to them $125 and they'll say you're supporting Amelia, Charlotte, Erika, Lily, or one of those cats. But this is a refuge that has to handle people's desires to have cougars. In, um, <clears throat> excuse me, this refuge, as you can see right up here, is known as PAWS. And what we find when we go through PAWS directory is some of the cats they've got there. Blake, that's a mountain lion. Uh, they purchased him as a pet after he was confiscated by the owners. Don't know the whole story. Diz, a mountain lion, was bred for the pet trade, was confiscated because owners didn't have the proper permit. Samantha. Uh, was in a drive through safari park in Arizona, placed in a petting zoo, and a visitor felt sorry for her and bought her, but two late weeks, months later, she realized they couldn't handle her, and she was getting out of hand, so Paws ended up with her. Sasha is a mountain lion, found in the basement of a crack house in Detroit by a raid of federal agents, kept as a guard dog, and actually the lion as guard dogs has been... Um, uh, it's been known to occur in several situations with drug houses. Well, my hat is off to the people that try to handle these pets that are let go. And it's a tough job because once you take on a cat, it might live 20 years. You've got to have a large space for it. 
if it's a big large cat, you've got to feed it a lot of food, which costs a lot of money. And all these refuge places have but a limited capacity to be able to take the cats in. Uh, and I'm thankful for them, but I worry about the ones that are let loose. And give you a couple of examples. I was called in in Wisconsin. They kept having cougar tracks show up in this area. Let me think a minute. Um, it was between Rhinelander and Tomahawk, but mostly around Tomahawk. And I was getting sent photographs of good cougar track signs. There was no question. We had a cougar there. And um, so I got called in, went in there to look. And the interesting thing was, remember in Wisconsin, I've got my tracking teams of over 300 trackers. And it was only being found primarily around, to uh, yeah, around Tomahawk. So I went in and I spent several days and got on the tracks and tracked it back to a bar outside Tomahawk where the tracks went to the door and didn't come out. So we confronted the bar owner the next day. Yep, it was his pet cougar and he loved running it around and creating turmoil in the neighborhood to get good gossip at the bar. Another bar situation what we had uh, down in Illinois was this owner that would run his cougar and it would run and come back to him, but he would take it into the bar and set it on a bar stool next to him and feed it beer. Uh, a couple of examples of people with their exotic cougars and have been involved with several others. Well, where are they coming from? They're coming from the cat trade. High Lonesome Ranch, West Virginia is one of the big traders and uh, you can go in there to get your animals. Another one is Bitterroot, Bobcat and Lynx. Welcome to Bobcats Online, the real thing. And you can go in there. Notice down here in the center, a little category that says pricing and availability of what you can get, assorted links. Uh, here's another one. This is Animal Marketplace. And you can buy your exotic animals here. And uh, it tells you which ones are sell for sale. And the rare sale, those prices go up on some of those rare cats. Animal Finder's Guide for obtaining difficult and high, high and hard to find information. You not only can buy through here, you can place ads through here to sell your cat. So here's some prices to give you an idea. If you want a cougar kitten, we can get you one for $1,500 because it's small, it's cute, it's cuddly, uh, and it's a week old, so $1,500. By the time they're five weeks old, oh, only $1,000. And six weeks old, here's a $1,500 one. I just threw in for comparison several cats and Jeffrey cats from Asia and um, $2,800 each. Jeffrey cats taking deposits. Now notice when I did this was January 2005, those prices have gone up since then. And nowadays, last time I checked, if you wanted a cougar, I could get you an adult cougar for $300 was all it would cost you. But if you wanted a kitten, you might be paying $2,000 for it. Well, Darn, aren't there some laws that are regulating the trade of cougars and what's going on out there? Well, back in 1900, we passed a thing called the Lacey Act. And the Lacey Act dealt with the importation into and between and among states. It had nothing to do with the uh, private possession once somebody owned a cat. It didn't guarantee the cat would have good living conditions or whatever. And as long as it was housed in one state and wasn't moved, and it does not govern any aspect of the animal's care and treatment. As you saw with divorcees, chain them behind the houses, some of these cats end up treated very, very poorly. Well, given the deficiencies in the Federal Lacey Act, in 2003, it was amended to try to give it a little more teeth. It banned the importation, transfer, and sale of large cats for use as pets. It banned that through interstate transportation, but it does not ban private ownership. Well, that sounds pretty good initially until you start looking at the loophole. You are allowed to buy a large cat, including a cougar, over the internet and pick it up in the state of purchase. As long as you pick it up where it's purchased, then you can drive it where you want. Those states where it's bought legally are also allowed to ship it to states where it's legal to possess. 
uh, if you buy a cougar within the state and uh, that sells it and transport it within the state, that's legal. And then here's the kicker that I really like. It's called the Animal Welfare Act Exhibitor. If you get this federal license and at least once a year, you exhibit your cat to the neighborhood school, 4-H group or whatever, you are allowed to own the cat. Now, these are laws at the federal level, and states, of course, can make laws that go beyond the federal level. The problem is state laws vary dramatically from no law at all uh, to uh, some that are very restrictive. For instance, in Michigan, you cannot own a large cat. In Wisconsin, you must have a permit. In some states that are very restrictive, you must have a zoo permit to own even one cat. Well, this map, we're not going to read the fine print here, but I just want you to look at the colors up here on the map. Four categories. Uh, this, um, oh, I don't know what color to call this when I've got my arrow bouncing up and down in. That's states where uh, you can't own large cats. And then there's uh, uh, different sorts of bans and requirements in the different states. And what we see is a hodgepodge of laws that make governing the pet cougar a very difficult thing. You want some good information on mountain lions, there are several sites out there that I highly recommend. The Mountain Lion Foundation is one of these sites. And if you will uh, go there, they typically have um, some of the latest news of what's going on. Now, this is Mountain Lion Foundation here again, and just some of their web page. Uh, good site to go to. You can learn quite a little bit there. Another good uh, uh, site is the Cougar Fund. And the Cougar Fund is actually run out of um, Jackson, I believe now, Jackson, Wyoming. Uh, and Mark Beckoff, who's one of the great animal behavioralists of wolves, coyotes, and cats is involved with that site. Uh, so there, go there for good information, and they do collect uh, uh, money to help support the cats. The Florida Panther Society is a very good one. This only deals, though, with the cougars down in Florida, but they've got lots of very good information and highly recommend those. Now, Born Free and the Animal Protection Institute merged several years ago into the API for animals. That's the Animal Protection Institute for Animals. <clears throat> Again, a good source of um, information. In the campaign corner, you'll see over there, perhaps it says exotic pets. So they deal with the pet trade issue also. This is probably in many ways, not the best pet site, but it's the best uh, cougar, wild cougar site and it does occasionally have pet information. And that's cougarnet.org. I um, um, mentioned it earlier in one of the other lectures at Cougarnet. You can go to their big picture map here. And if you'll click on that big picture map, it will bring up a map where you can click on the states, go to a state. And every one of those little dots you see is an investigated report of a cougar. And if you click on the dot, you can download a PDF that gives you all the details on that. And that's especially interesting as you get out here in the eastern third of the United States. They have several good publications. And one thing I would like to recommend on their site is they have a uh, mountain lion field guide produced by Harley Shaw. It's an excellent color publication and you can download it as a PDF. It's only available as a PDF. So I strongly recommend the CougarNet org. Okay, what about the cougar if it's present there? Uh, when I get called in or I get a report, I have to ask several key questions of myself. Is that cougar wild versus a pet? And to that question, one of the things that's advancing right now a lot is uh, some of the genetic groups across the country have been getting genetic samples from the game farms. So more and more we're able to say that um, uh, sample that we got on this cougar running wild looks like it matches up 
with Big Eyes Game Farm in Northwest Montana in that gene, gene pool up there. So this is giving us more and more of a way to look at this question of wild versus a pet. Early on, somebody asked me about cougars in New York. And what I can tell you is that there are no breeding populations, for example, in New York. The sampling mechanism of hunters and roads up there makes it impossible for us to have missed a cougar population. We had several Eastern cougar projects that for several decades worked extensively hard at documenting cougars all along the Eastern coast and inland, and were never able to document a wild cougar there. The question I have to ask next we're dealing with, is it a legal versus illegal pet? And let me share one case that I had on that. Uh, I got a call from attorneys in California and there had been a real estate agent driving to work in the dark and he hit a horse in his car and was killed. And uh, the owner or the families of the real estate agent were suing the owner of the horse. The uh, owner of the horse corral where he was being boarded and the manager of the boarding corral, all for negligence in the horse getting loose. But in the investigation, they discovered that a large wooden board was broken and that's where the horse had probably left. And there were tracks on the board. So they sent them to me and um, I looked at the tracks and there no question, they were cat tracks and they were big, but there was just something that wasn't right. So I told the attorneys I would have to have I'd have to come out there and see it. And they were wanting me to help defend uh, this group of people. And uh, when I said it was a cat, Cal Fish and Game, California Fish and Game got involved and they started thinking, uh oh, big cat, cougar. And so they started trapping. And the defense department sent me um, a stack of depositions, literally two and a half feet tall with photographs. And they said, we preserved that log with the footprints. And I said, well, fine, I need to come out and see it and see the situation. And they said, okay, and started setting up a trip. And in the meantime, Cal Fish and Game traps a cat near the ranch. Guess what kind of cat? Cougar is not the correct answer. It was a tiger. Now, a big, big male cougar is 175 pounds. We generally never see over 150, 160 around here. Cougars go, I'm sorry, tigers go 500 pounds. Well, immediately when the tiger is captured, they use what's called an RFID scanner, radio frequency identification tag. That's a little radio the size of a grain of rice that's inserted into the back of the neck of an animal by a veterinarian. And they run the scanner over and identified the tiger. And they looked up the owner. And uh, as soon as the owner was found, the lawsuit dropped the first three and named the owner as the one at fault. And as the owner was questioned and so on, turns out this tiger has been running loose in the neighborhood for 10 months, 10 months. Wow. And thank goodness it hadn't decided that there was something on two legs to feed on. And anyway, now that the owner's named in the lawsuit, I didn't get my trip to California on that one. So the first question is, is it wild versus a pet? The second question I've got to answer, is it a legal versus illegal cougar? Then the third question, is this one animal migrating through or is there a population? And um, for that, we train tracking crews all across North America in the class I run called Cougar Ecology and Verification is a 16 hour class, which I've shortened down uh, several of the lectures for today. And I haven't given any of the lectures on tracks, signs, how to track animals, um, the sounds and so on. Maybe we'll arrange something else down the line for to do that. But with our tracking teams, we go in. Folks, if you've got a cougar running around, it is not hard to verify, especially if you're in a country that's got snow. So it doesn't take much to train people to do that. And the classic example is tracking a single cougar. My tracking teams have tracked single cougars completely across diagonally the state of Wisconsin. 
So once we decide whether it's a population, our next question, is that just the transient animal went through or is this breeding, is this a breeding animal and a breeding population? And again, all of the verification skills that we're teaching are critical to answering those questions there. Okay, with that, I'm gonna end up pets and how they complicate uh, cougar sightings. And, you know, anywhere I'd have to say, anywhere in the United States, we could have a person have a valid cougar sighting. But then we've got to go into the question of, is that a cougar, a pet, or is it represent a transient animal or the establishment of a population? And since I've been working on this, I've watched the establishment of breeding populations in Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota, where we went from occasional sightings up to now good breeding populations. And I've watched the spread across the Mississippi into Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and then going southwest from there. Uh, the Ozarks, Missouri have a lot of cougar reports. A lot of that originated from um, cougars that were let go down there that were domestic. So with all of that, uh, let's open up for questions on cougars as pets first, then we'll go to catch up questions for the whole workshop. So Shauna and Garrett, can you join us? Hello, hello. So we let's address the questions that came in for this session and then maybe we can capture some of those other ones that we missed. Um, first one is, um, is there, do you know of any legislation, current legislation or any um, uh, states that have homeowners insurance uh, clauses? Many homeowners insurances can actually dictate what type of dog you can have. Are there also things that would apply to exotic pets? Um, do you know of anything? Wow, I have no knowledge of anything from the insurance companies that would address the exotic cats. That's a real interesting question. Uh, somebody read your homeowner's uh, policies and see what you can find and email me your answer. Garrett, do you want to take one of the other ones? Yeah, if you jump into that. Um, I do know that certain states do have what they call pet amnesty days, um, in which if you do have an illegal or exotic pet, that there are certain days of the year that you're allowed to turn them in without consequence. Um, so <laughs> pretty interesting. I know, I know Florida is one of those states, um, as it's a hotbed. But uh, yeah, the, the other question we have, or the other questions we have um, uh, kind of um, are addressing earlier presentations. Is that all right, Jim? You go ahead and make that jump. Let's stall for a second. Any more pet questions out there, folks? I don't see anything. Okay, let's go to other questions. I know, Shauna, you had a hang fire. Um, yes, yeah, so we had a previous question come in after um, a session ended that was concerning um, mother uh, cats and how protective a mother might be against other species. Specifically, they asked um, against uh, wolves or bears, or if they would be um, aggressive against a human trying to access a den with kittens? Well, I can't address that question directly. I do know at one time, I wish Dan Staler were still on, uh, the Wolf Project we had documented four cougars were killed by uh, the wolves. Uh, two of those were kittens, and I'm not sure about the other two. The two kittens belonged to one mother who was not able to protect them. And I think at least one of the other ones uh, was a kitten also. And we need an update on that piece of information. On the other hand, cougars had killed four wolves at one time. Uh, one was a adult wolf. And um, boy, I'm trying to think, I think it was Abby Nelson that was outside the park to the west and going up the trail. Um, I remember it was Abby. It was one of the lady researchers who had worked here at the park and then got on with a game and fish. She was going up the trail and all of a sudden this wolf came barreling down the trail, almost knocked her over. And she went on up and found a cougar on top a um, 
wolf that it had killed. And the other one was running to get out of there to say the least. And so one time I know cougars had killed four wolves, but the question dealt with um, how defensive is a mom in defending her kittens and nothing is coming to my mind to answer that directly. Okay, and then we had one more. Garrett's gonna take that one. Uh, yeah, we had a question uh, regarding cougar scat. I know, I know Brad's on here as well, if you wanna chime in. Um, maybe the contents of scat, we know that they obviously shear or shave their, their, uh, their prey. Um, looking at bone chips, um, you know, hair versus the, the actual content of the scat. So if you guys wanna chime in with the percentages of, of what you found in the scat and why that might be. We did one detailed analysis breaking open lots and lots of scat. And I can't tell you the exact percentages, but uh, first off, some exotic things we found during that. Cats eat a lot of berries. In fact, most carnivores won't turn down anything that's got good sugar. And um, they ate juniper berries, which to me are not, ugh, that's not a, not a good item. I'm not quite sure why they did. It is edible. Uh, they use it to make the flavoring in gin, I guess. Um, and we found a good percentage of scats in the summer that had grass of various types. And I mentioned this earlier, those scats, possibly the grass is being eaten to move through the uh, stomach intestinal tract to scrape out internal parasites. And then the scats we could break down in sort of the cycle of feeding. Those scats that initially come out of the cats are what we call cow pie ones. Uh, they are very moist, high protein, black, stink to high oven, and they can come out bloop as a patty. It dries out in the cats fairly quickly into a toothpaste scat, uh, which is a long tube, and all the carnivores will make that. Uh, in a Louisiana study where they had um, Department of Natural Resource people trying to identify scat, and they showed all sorts of cougar scat in there. Um, those toothpaste ones that were made by coyotes, wolves, dogs, cats, just the early succulent meat, uh, all black. Uh, the success rate of identification was well below 40%. And uh, when you looked at all the scat, it didn't get much above 40%. Um, and then the scat starts, as time goes along, the carcass is disappearing, starts seeing more hair showing up in it. Um, initially, we don't see much hair and more bone chips as the meat's being exhausted, lots and lots more bone chips wrapped in the hair, finally down to uh, literally just hair and not much sign of protein in there at all. But percentages on that, that's too far back in my memory. Jim, just a, an additional aspect of that question. Is there a behavioral difference between wolf scat and cat scat having more bone chips in it it, is it related to how much time a cat might spend with a particular carcass versus how much time a wolf would spend with a carcass? I think it's related to cats grind up, uh, chew up ribs and bones a lot more than the wolves do. Wolves tend to do what we call high grading. They eat the nice big succulent meat and they then kind of wander off and see if they can find something else with big juicy steaks. Uh, only in desperate times do the wolves really get down uh, to grinding into the bones, they may gnaw on them a little, but cats chew up bones a lot more of the time. Particularly cats chew up bones, the rib bones of the sternum and the attachments to the uh, mid and lower bones, they'll chew those open to get around the stomach and into the chest cavity where they can get at the heart, liver, that sort of thing, and they chew those up. On that same note, I know uh, Dan had a, a couple of slides regarding um, especially competition when, uh, when cats have brought down prey and then wolves or bears have moved into the area, is there an average on how often cats need to eat? Um, and I'm sure that depends on what they take down, but let's just talk about big prey, for example. Well, that sort of data were very hard to come by until Kerry Murphy come by. And what Kerry did is uh, he instigated a project where he would track an individual cougar. And when he had a cougar that was radio collared, on a carcass, he would go out there and he would follow that cougar uh, for days on end, camping on the trail until it made another kill. 
and he would be able to tell exactly how many days between kills. And that was our first real data sets on how often a cougar kills. And I'm thinking Kerry did something like 28 of those sequences, don't hold me that number. And he tried to spread them out between males, females, females with kittens. Um, Tony Ruth's new book has some of that data in it. And now with the uh, new motion collars, we've got a much better handle on how often a cougar kills because since they were so secretive, earlier researchers couldn't uh, follow that. And um, one of the things we do know is since the wolves were brought in, that the cougars are having to kill more often because they've been driven off their kills uh, more frequently. Um, and uh, I don't have any of the numbers off the top of my head, but females with large kittens actually had a higher kill rate, if I remember right, than large males. And that makes sense. They're feeding two, three, four animals. Highly recommend Tony's new book, incidentally, folks. Um, I have another question here, Jim. Um, this uh, pertains to um, humans' perceptions of cougars. Um, do you have any insight as to why some communities would have a generally positive um, or neutral attitude, if you will, towards um, cougars, while other communities tend to have a negative view of wild cougars? Whoa, and all the investigations we did up and down the front range of Colorado, from small town to large towns, I could say I would find every type of opinion you could have from very good to very bad about the cougars. Um, uh, I, I'm not sure I kind of feel it's a community-wide thing. Within the Gardner community, you've got a lot of very pro-cougar people, a lot of whom are on this seminar, and they kind of all know each other and all have same attitudes. But there's also some folks that don't have pro-cougar attitudes there. And this leads back to a question that Ashia had asked earlier. Um, just thinking about ways to move forward in our community, she was asking if there is um, access to that pamphlet that FWP had put out, uh, or Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and if not, if it would be um, possible for us to find some funding sourcing for us to actually create one for homeowners here in the town of Gardner, and potentially for vacation rental um, units to help educate um, about um, the presence of cougars and how to keep our community safe and how to keep the cougars safe as well. I covered that in uh, the living with cougars part. I suggest somebody call Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks and see if those are still available. I would suggest that we consider um, the uh, plastic bag hang on the doorknob thing that would have maybe a wallet card a pamphlet like that or a pamphlet we can create. I've got a lot of them. I've got templates for them. And uh, we could, I'm sure, just asking this group here, we would have the donations to pay for any printing we wanted on that. And it just takes someone that's willing to spearhead it. And I'm willing to work with materials I've already got. I do have in my materials copies of the Montana one. But uh, in both the Montana and Colorado one, there's one major set of glaring errors that um, I'd kind of prefer seeing a new one made rather than using the existing ones. And doing a panel wouldn't be that difficult, or a pamphlet, a uh, trifold, eight and a half by 11 wouldn't be that different, difficult. So if somebody would like to bite into it, I'm happy to help them on uh, getting started, but need somebody to take that responsibility. Thanks, Jim. Garrett, do you do you see anything else for right now? Um, looking now, and do not. Um, that might be it, Jim. Okay. Well, it's been quite a crew. Um, and one of the things I dislike dramatically about this Zoom meeting is we can't see each other, shake hands, and say hello, and appreciate the great interest that we've got. Uh, with our fellow group. We had, just one second, um, 95 slots out of the 99 that we had available 
uh, were filled. And probably uh, Garrett and Shauna, you guys have been kind of watching. Uh, how many people were watching some of the presentations? What was sort of an average attendance? I think we were averaging uh, pretty much 70 or 80 um, throughout most of the day, which is pretty, pretty stellar in my opinion. Yeah, that's what I was getting to. And um, I, a message just flashed on my screen that somebody raised the hand. Uh, if that person could maybe type a question into the question and answer uh, panel there. I'm very impressed. I'm sure they didn't come here to hear me talk. They came here because we used the word cougar in there, and that shows the level of interest that those bring. Uh, also, on the original announcement, there is a number, 406 848 1206. And that's a citing number, and feel free to um, use that number to uh, turn in any sightings that you have on cougars. Can you repeat that number again, Jim? I'm gonna type it in. Okay, I was just trying to get set, but I'll let you do it. It's 406. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, 848-1206. Jim, is and that for or all wildlife in general? Oh, I don't think we want all wildlife. Uh, uh, let's say, let's maybe hold that to cougars uh, in the northern Gardner, oh, northern range of Yellowstone, north down the valley. You can text it. Uh, it's best if you text uh, that number because there's not somebody there to answer it all the time. 